If you are building an entry level car audio system, you are going to be looking for an amplifier that is reliable and has good sound quality, but is also in line with an entry level budget. JL Audio recently released their new line of JD series amplifiers as a solution for this application. We all know that everyone's favorite first car audio upgrade is adding a subwoofer. JL took this into account with this line by having a 250 watt, a 500 watt, and an 1000 watt monoblock option for subwoofer amplifiers, and also adding a four channel 400 watt option to match for when we are amplifying speakers as well. The question is though, with these amplifiers being entry level, what features features do they have? After all, there's a ton of amps on the market that are at this power rating. What makes these unique? How can we install one of these and set the settings? JL Audio was cool enough to partner up with us on this video and send over the JD250-1. So in this video, we're gonna take an in-depth look at this new amplifier. So first off, why do I even have this amplifier? Well, I'm going to be using it on the entry level subwoofer box build. And the way that I'm gonna be using this is a little bit unique, so stay tuned for details on that towards the end of the video. Let's start with a quick unboxing. First things first, looking at the packaging, obviously a picture of the amplifier on there and then on the back some more of the specs and details one thing I noticed right away that is really nice is they not only give you the dimensions of the overall amplifier size they also give you the dimensions to the centers of the bolt locations so if you are a shop or do this professionally and you're designing an amplifier rack beforehand it's nice because if you're doing that on the computer you know exactly where you need a machine to make these holes this is something that I really wish more manufacturers would do opening up the box here you can see that with the we have some Allen keys for tightening down our different wires. We also have the instruction manual. And then in this protective packaging here, the amplifier itself. We pull it out of this protective sleeve. A nice brushed aluminum finish here. And we can see that this center piece here, it's kind of like a glossy acrylic. And it looks like they have a protective film on it that will pull off once fully installed. Now it's easy enough to just talk about the different power ratings for this amplifier, but you guys know that in these videos, I like to go more in depth and look at kind of the unique features of the amplifier. So we'll just get those power ratings out of the way. And I will say one unique thing that I do like here is that JL Audio does list some of the power ratings at 12.5 volts. This is nice because not every system is going to have an upgraded alternator or 10 batteries or anything crazy like that for electrical, especially when you're doing an entry level build using something like this amplifier. Amplifier. So it is nice to know that you're still getting a substantial amount of power at that 12.5 volt rating. Now a quick note here about power ratings. Obviously there are a ton of different amplifiers on the market that are in this entry level range for the power output. But something important to consider is there's much more to an amplifier and its performance and its value than how many watts it produces. My point here is that features and design are definitely worth considering just as much as power output. So more on these things shortly. On the side of the amplifier here, we can see all of the power connections, and these are only going to need to be an eight gauge wire size for this particular amplifier, but I will say these look more than large enough to fit a four gauge wire. We'll check that out in a little bit. Next to the power connections are the speaker connections for the subwoofer, and this is a mono block amplifier, so if you're unfamiliar with how this works, basically these two connections are tied together, and these two connections are tied together, so it doesn't matter as long as you have a positive and negative, you could use these two, you could use the outer two, you could use this one and this one, it doesn't matter because they're connected internally. The reasoning for this is it just makes it easier to connect a subwoofer with multiple voice coils, or if you're connecting multiple different subs, and to wire them like you need to, to in order to present the correct ohm load to the amplifier. The speaker outputs here are also substantially sized. You could easily fit a 12 gauge wire or even larger by the looks of these. The other thing I noticed right away about these terminals I really like is they're really, really deep. And if we go ahead and check it there, you can see just how deep it is. A lot of times with amplifiers, they only have a little bit of depth to them, so they just barely grab onto that wire, and then you're left with wire that's kind of exposed, unless obviously you're using something like a ferrule. But with these, what's nice is that wire goes so deep in there, 
you're not gonna have any extra wire exposed. It's just going to be that insulation. So that's the power and speaker connections. Now on the side here, this is where they have the RCA or speaker level inputs. They also have outputs so you could chain to another amplifier. They also have a connection here for the RBC-1 remote level controller. And you'll notice that all the settings are only on this side. There's none on that side there. There's none on the bottom, obviously. There's none on the top. So this is nice because if you have a nice compact install, you only need to worry about having access to this one side of the amp to make our setting changes. We're going to talk more about these when we connect everything up. The clipping level indicator is really, really interesting and cool on this amplifier. I'm gonna show you guys that in a little bit, but I did wanna mention that the low pass crossover here is adjustable from 50 hertz up to 500 hertz, and it's a 12 dB per octave slope. Now, while I open up this amplifier and you guys take a look at the guts, I did wanna mention that there are a few more unique features, and some are JL Audio's proprietary technology that is built into this amplifier namely their next D switching technology. The problem in car audio is that the power supply, especially in an entry level system, it's usually not the best. And if the power supply sags, the signal can be distorted, even far below clipping. Without getting overly technical, the next D tech basically allows the amplifier to remain small. It allows the amp to be very efficient and not require as much current and leads to clean and powerful output. Additionally, this amp has differential balanced inputs. This is a feature that costs more for a manufacturer to implement, but it helps prevent unwanted noise from entering on the input side of the amplifier. We all know that there's nothing worse than having ground loop noise, whining, or other system noise on our system, and the differential balanced inputs prevent this. This is a feature that you don't find on a lot of other entry level amps. So we know the initial features on this amplifier. Let's run through making all the connections and doing an install. To do this, we're gonna be using my shop tunes stereo that I recently built here on the channel. This has a car audio head unit. It's powered off a car battery. So this is basically a car audio system outside of the vehicle. We've also got some nice JL Audio C3 component speakers now installed in here to test along with all this JL gear. And we have our signal output here that we can use for sending our subwoofer signal to the amp. Now something worth noting is we don't have to have an aftermarket head unit to use this amplifier. The RCA connections on this amplifier allow us to use a speaker level input and JL Audio actually has an adapter for this that you see on screen. That way you can tap into the speaker level signal of an OEM system. You don't need a line output converter. You can take speaker level input straight into this amp. Now, first things first, for installing this amplifier, you would obviously want to mount it into the vehicle using these mounting locations. And I will say it's nice that they're nice and far away from the amplifier. They're easily accessed, but that's the only thing we're not gonna be doing in this video because obviously we're installing this on the test bench. Next up, we need to make our power connections. Now for this amplifier, you only need an eight gauge wire, but I'm actually using four gauge wire here, which you can see fits. And for the larger JD amps, the 500 slash one and the 1000 slash one, you need four gauge wire. You would also wanna make sure that your positive battery connection is fused as close to the battery as possible. In this case, I would use a 30 amp fuse for this amp. The next thing I need to attach is this remote turn on lead, which will tell the amplifier to turn on, but for this amplifier, there's actually three different ways to do this. Those three different ways correspond to this switch here, which says turn on mode, and we can do remote, we can do offset, or we can do signal. The first setting on that switch is our traditional method where we actually connect this wire to a switched 12 volt source that turns on whenever our head unit comes on. So when we're using an aftermarket head unit, this is oftentimes a good choice, but if we're using an OEM system where we haven't upgraded the head unit, it may be different difficult to find a switched 12 volt lead. So if we didn't have the ability to do option number one, we would switch to option number two, which is offset. By using the DC offset sensing, the amplifier will turn on and off by detecting the presence of a very small DC signal that is typical in the audio output of most factory head units. So what that means is in order for option number two to turn this amplifier on and off, it needs to have the speaker level signal connected to input number one here on the amp. If we're not using a speaker level signal to send to the amp, that option will not work. The other thing about option number two is if we've tapped into a speaker level signal and left that speaker connected, in other words, we've tapped into like a rear speaker and we're trying to install this subwoofer amp, what can happen is when you close the doors of the vehicle or make the speakers somehow how move, it can send signal into this amplifier and tell the amp to turn on when you don't want it to turn on. And if that is happening, then you would want to use 
selection number three. Option number three still requires that we're using a high level signal into the amp, but what's different is instead of monitoring for a DC offset, it's monitoring for an actual audio signal to be coming in here. So when it detects musical frequencies coming in this input, it knows to turn the amplifier on, and if those frequencies go away for 30 seconds, it knows to turn the amp off. The input voltage switch here also corresponds to what wires we are connecting. If we are doing a speaker level connection where we're tapping into the factory OEM system, we want to set the input voltage to high, but if we're using RCA low-level inputs out of our aftermarket head unit, in that case we would want to use low-level. A unique feature about this amplifier is that it has these RCA pre-outs, which is nice because if we wanted to send signal to another amplifier, let's say we we're using two of these amps, we could easily do so. And that's nice because we don't have to have a splitter or anything at the aftermarket head unit. If we're using an OEM system, we don't have to tap into two different sets of wires. We could simply do the one amp here and then have these coming out. And the other thing that's actually kind of unique and cool is in our low level signal setting, this would also be a low level signal output. But if we are at our high level setting, this gets attenuated on the voltage. So it still is a low level signal coming out of here. The other thing that's nice is that the filter settings on the amplifier do not affect the signal coming out of this. The bandwidth of frequency that you have coming in is going to be the same as coming out. The last connection on this side is for the optional RBC1 remote level controller. This is optional and sold separately, which is nice because not every system requires that you have one of these. If you were just adding just this amp, yes, it is nice to add it on, but if you were using this amplifier in a multi-amp setup where you had something like a DSP that you were going to be using the controller on instead, it's nice to not have to be required to purchase this when you might not need it. The way the controller works is when it's unplugged, the amplifier will just use its max output. But when it is plugged in, it acts as a volume attenuator, meaning as we turn it down, the amplifier output is also going to turn down. The final installation connection to make here is for our speaker wires. And remember, just because there are two different sets does not make this a two channel amplifier. This is still a single mono block amplifier. These connections are wired together and these are wired together. And like I mentioned earlier, this is just so that we can easily connect multiple subwoofers or multiple voice coil subwoofers. These are very, very substantially sized. I did want to show you guys, this is an eight gauge wire here. You could even add an eight gauge wire for speaker wire if you wanted to. But in this case, I'm using 12 gauge wire, which is more than substantial for 250 watts. So we now have all of our connections made. We'll just double check and verify everything and once we are good to go we can then add the fuse to the positive lead going to the battery which will ready us for powering this up. There are still three more settings here that we need to go over, but the one that I like to make sure is adjusted before we power up is our crossover. What the crossover is doing is it's limiting the frequencies that are going to our subwoofer. That's because our subwoofer isn't designed to play the vocals or the highs, it's designed to play bass. So we wanna limit it to the bass range of frequencies. And a good starting point for a subwoofer amplifier is to set at 80 hertz, but this can vary based on the speakers that you're using. This this is something that you can fine tune later. So I've now turned on the system and along with that, our amplifier has turned on for the first time. We know the amp is powered up because of this blue light here. Now when the amp goes through its boot up sequence, a red light will turn on for just a second here, but if it goes off, we're in a good running condition. But if it were to stay on or if it were to be flashing, that means that we have some sort of issue with our install. To see what that issue may be, we can refer to the instruction manual, but it is nice that the amp gives us some feedback if there is an issue issue so we can determine what it is. The thing I've been most excited to show you guys on this amp is the new clipping level indicator for the input sensitivity. Now if you're new to car audio, the whole reason that we need to adjust the input sensitivity is every different source unit has a different voltage that is coming in with the signal to our amplifier. If we're using a very low voltage, we need to be able to adjust that properly using the input sensitivity so that we get maximum output out of this amp. And if we're using a very high 
voltage, we need to be able to turn down the input sensitivity so that we don't have any clipping or distortion coming out of our amp. In the manual, they do a great job of explaining how this process works, and you can also check out the link down in the video description to their help desk where they have a page about how to do this. Basically, we start with disconnecting the speaker output from the amplifier, and then on our radio or our head unit, we're gonna wanna make sure that we disable any bass boost or any loudness type controls. We're also going to make sure that our speakers are disconnected. We're going to play a 50 hertz, zero dB track, and we're going to turn up our volume to three quarters of the way. If you do have the professional grade tools like an oscilloscope or the DD1 to verify that you don't have any distortion coming out of the head unit at that three quarter volume, that is a good thing to do. But if you don't have those expensive professional grade tools, this is an entry level system setup. So we're gonna make do with the three quarter volume method. I also unplugged the remote subwoofer level control. I have the input voltage switch on low and I can now start turning up the input sensitivity dial. I'm going to turn up this dial until you see this light around the dial turn on. This is indicating that the amplifier is currently clipping. If this light were to turn on before we even started turning up the input sensitivity, we would then switch the input voltage to high. With the red light, we are experiencing clipping so we can back off slightly until that light goes away and we are now perfectly set. For those of you wondering, I did double check this with the DD1 and that light illuminates at the same time as the distortion light. Now that the input sensitivity is set correctly, we can turn down the volume on the head unit. We can reconnect our speaker output wire, reconnect all of our speakers, and we can reconnect the remote volume control. The last setting here you might wanna adjust, especially when you're using a stock car audio system to send signal to this amplifier, is the bass boost. This is basically basically an EQ channel at 45 hertz, which allows us to increase the amount of output at that frequency. Now understand that it is only centered at 45 hertz. So in other words, it doesn't affect just 45 hertz. That's just where it's centered. It affects bass slightly below it and slightly above it as well. But a lot of times if you're using the stock head unit from your car to provide the signal for this, they will have the bass be a lot lower than it needs to be. So it's nice that we can EQ it and add it back in with the bass boost. So now that we have everything installed and connected, we can do a test listen. Let's use the entry level subwoofer box build that I just finished here in a previous video. Let's get this turned on and jam in using some royalty free music. So in an upcoming video, I'm gonna be installing this amplifier onto that subwoofer box that you saw, but the goal is going to be making the whole system quickly and easily removable. I have a couple different things here that we're gonna try out using in that video to make that happen. Should be a fun little challenge. So if you wanna catch that video, I'd love to have you as a subscriber. To see the new JD series of amplifiers, you can check out a JL Audio dealer near you, or you can check out the link down in the video description. Again, a special thanks to JL for partnering with us on this video, and thank you guys for watching.